December 10th, 1980, 12.45 p.m. A Loomis armored guard was waiting for an elevator in the University of Alberta's Student Union Building holding $300,000 of cash. In the middle of the afternoon, two gunmen walk up to him with balaclavas, a rifle, and a handgun. They rob him of the cash, his gun, and push him to the ground. With 15 shocked onlookers watching, they dashed off into the winter wonderland that is December in Edmonton and were never heard from again. The whole ordeal took 40 seconds. This was Edmonton's first armored car robbery for Loomis, and investigators were at a loss what to do. The only lead they had to go on was that it was two men, about 26 or 27, both 5'8". Even with $30,000 reward and ads all over the news, no new information came out about the bandits. The case went cold. While this kind of stuff was new to Western Canada, it was prevalent in the East. However, the Montreal bankers were getting wise, the city was getting too crowded, and the police were getting too close. It was time to expand. August 31st, 1981, 3 p.m. A lone Brinks guard was delivering approximately $50,000 to a Hudson's Bay and Southgate Mall. He takes the escalator to the second floor and when he reaches the top, two men jump him, stealing his gun and a satchel of cash. He wrestled one of the men to the ground when he spotted the other training his revolver on the pair. He pulled away in time for the pair of thieves to get up and run as the Hudson's Bay security descended on the scene. One guard was assaulted, and despite this being in a crowded shopping mall in the middle of the afternoon, the pair got away thanks to a third man driving a silver Thunderbird. The Edmonton police said that the whole heist went very smoothly, but really, they were probably lucky on their end, so they must not be professionals, right? This time their getaway car was found abandoned and sketches were produced. With another case gone cold, the Edmonton Police Service turned to the SVPM for assistance, or the Service de Police de la Ville de Montreal. The police in Montreal had been creating a laundry list of possible suspects for these high-stakes daylight cash grabs and concluded that they were Quebecois criminals coming west. Montreal and the other cities in the east had been beefing up security around the banks, while Western Canada had largely been ignoring the issue. The next heist wouldn't prove to be as lucky. February 3rd, 1982, 11 a.m. Once again, in the student union building of the University of Alberta, two guards from Loomis were taking $300,000 cash to the CIBC branch in the building when four balaclava wearing gunmen jumped them. They were armed with two handguns and a rifle. They managed to wrestle the satchel and a revolver off one of the guards, but the other had time to unholster his pistol. Six or seven shots of 38 Special flew past the four fleeing felons, and they had time to return fire. Unfortunately, one of them wasn't so lucky. He was shot in the hip, and the trail of blood marked where he was dragged into the getaway car. The police immediately put eyes on every hospital in a 150 kilometer radius. Despite having the same methods, this heist had been so sloppy that the police initially didn't connect the two. A team member had been shot, and they only made off with about 180,000 of the purported over half a million, and they were almost cornered while escaping. They managed to ditch their vehicle in Edmonton's Castle Downs neighborhood and escape, but the police were only minutes behind them. They had gotten away, but barely. A few months later, the pistols were found by some kids playing in the woods off of 123rd Street and 145 Avenue. The men would lay low for months. August 11th, 1982, 11.30 a.m. Three men walked into a bank of Montreal in the Bonnie Dune Shopping Center. They were wearing nylon masks and brandishing a handgun, an automatic rifle, and a Sten, which is a British World War II submachine gun that looks like a deadly drain pipe. A Loomis driver had just dropped off two bags full of money totaling $200,000. The smash and grab went mostly to plan, and the trio made off in two getaway cars. Once again, their cars were found, but they were not. Edmonton police started to piece together the lightning-fast, armored car drop-off style heists. The pieces were finally fitting into place for an M.O. 
November 24th, 1982, 3 p.m. A Loomis guard was taking a few satchels of cash totaling $1 million to the CIBC Securities Department off of 99th Street and Jasper Avenue. When coming up from the vault, he is tackled in the stairwell, hooded and handcuffed. The two assailants get away. Their 1978 cutlass is found as well as the money satchels, but no cash. It's unknown if the thieves knew they were stealing mostly deposit-only security checks. In total, the cash they stole was estimated to be around $1,200. At this point in time, the Edmonton police knew nothing. Who knows? Maybe they just wanted to hurt the bank on their end. December 20th, 1982, 1 p.m. A guard is carrying a cash pickup through the Westmount Woodwards when he is suddenly assaulted and pushed to the ground in the drapery department. Six money bags filled with half a million dollars are taken by two gunmen with masks and revolvers. They break for it, being chased by employees of the toy department and customers alike, but they ultimately get away. Their vehicle is found not far away, but they, once again, are not. December 29th, 1982, noon. Four gunmen pounced on a lone guard as he stepped off the escalator in a downtown Bay store. They already had drawn their revolvers and they had been holding civilians down for two minutes in the hopes that the guard wouldn't see. They grabbed $100,000 worth of cash and bolted through the store, screaming threats of shooting everyone who looked at them. Surprise, surprise, they got away with the bags and the vehicles were found. At this point, the total amount of cash and checks they had stolen totaled $3.2 million and the police had recovered none of it. All the police had to go on is a blood trail and some rough sketches. However, they were working with Vancouver, Calgary, and Montreal police to nail down the MO of this gang. Vancouver had to go through a similar robbery in October where thieves made off with $400,000. To these guys, the West was an open buffet of lone guards carrying hundreds of thousands. But hopefully, with this new partnership across Canada, these thieves could finally be brought to justice. Perhaps the crew finally understood their notoriety because between the year 1983 and 1984, there was almost nothing. While there were armored car and bank hits, they were all immediately solved. Most were homegrown guys who wanted to make a quick buck by emulating the Quebec touch, as they were called, and all of them were caught. The silence from the seemingly professional group baffled the authorities. Were they done with robbery and living the high life? Had they perished in a botched job somewhere? Were they still in Western Canada? Were they even in Canada? Who were they? December 24th, 1984, 1.15 p.m. After almost a year of relative peace and quiet from the Eastern professionals, a daring Christmas Eve heist was pulled off at Kingsway Garden Mall. Three men armed with revolvers jumped a Loomis guard exiting the Sears women's clothing department and made off with three bags. A five-minute heist netted them half a million dollars. This was the same level of professionalism as was displayed in 1982, with the same speed and precision. The only difference this time is that the Edmonton police were finally putting the puzzle pieces in place. This brings us to 1985. The downfall of the Quebec Touch and another French-Canadian gang dubbed the French Group by Edmonton Maximum Security Guards would all come down to a guy who just wanted to smoke a joint while he walked down the street. Daniel George Lindsay was picked up in Aylmer, Ontario after being caught smoking pot by the local OPP, or the Ontario Provincial Police. This would lead them to dig further into his history, and while not having a fixed address, the London branch of the OPP searched the place he was crashing, only to find equipment that had been linked to two bank robberies in Winnipeg and one in London. What should have been a minor slap on the wrist turned into Lindsay getting 12 years in prison thanks to his name being linked to up to 40 bank and armored car robberies between 1975 and 1984. Lindsay turned informant and tipped the RCMP off to Gerard Frederick Hubert. They raided his apartment at 1203-1050 Hardwood in Burnaby, BC, and found him, along with his common law partner, Danielle Gilbeau, with a number of illegal firearms and interesting items. This included a number of revolvers, a Sten gun, some semi-automatic rifles, a few shotguns, balaclavas, bulletproof vests, and thousands of dollars worth of makeup kits. This would lead to the further arrest of Curtis Duncan and Antonio Marola in Edmonton. Antonio Marola was the odd one out as he was a butcher by trade and didn't seem connected to any of the crimes, but eventually everything would come out. Recall the botch job in February of 1982 at the U of A's sub-building where a Loomis guard managed to fire a full 
full cylinder of 38 Special at the fleeing gang. He managed to hit one of them, the newly named Alan Strong, in the hip, and Strong was dragged back to the escape vehicle. While the cops made sure to patrol every hospital from Edmonton to Red Deer, no one ever did show up. That's because the gang took Strong back to Marola's butcher shop to get the bullet removed and patch him up. Marola tried his best, feeding Strong an excessive amount of painkillers while he ripped the slug out of the thief's hip. He sewed him up and Danielle nursed him back to health, or so they said. When asked where Strong was, no one could say. And when police across Canada went looking for him, they found no one. Lindsay ended up bringing the so-called Eastern gunman down with his confessions. He pointed the finger not only at his crew, but also Danielle Pruneau and his brothers from the French group, who seemingly took their place for a short period of time. That would end the non-violent era of criminals coming west of Ontario to ambush lone guards. Brinks and Loomis beefed up their security to match that of Eastern Canada, which meant that if anyone wanted to knock off an armored car, they would need some serious violent moves. Unfortunately, after 1985, that's exactly what transpired. December 1st, 1986, 2 p.m. A pair of Brinks guards were taking two sacks of money chained to a moving dolly from the Woodwards and Calgary's Market Mall. They got off the escalator on the ground floor when two men jumped out in front of them, armed with long barrel 357 Magnum revolvers. The thieves yelled freeze and then immediately began shooting. Around six shots were fired point blank to two guards two rounds hitting one of them while the other ducked and got away with a perforated winter coat. Civilians and employees hit the ground as the two men continued through the mall, firing and screaming as they rolled the trolleys to the getaway car. A third Brinks guard stationed at the truck saw the thieves as they exited the mall and began to give chase. The two men fired round after round into the armored car, eventually taking out its tires but losing an entire bag of money in the process. The guard parked on top of the errant money bag and the two got away pistols emptied, and down a quarter of a million dollars. After all this, they would disappear, but this time, Calgary police knew exactly who it was. Jean-Guy DiPietro and Aresto Panacui had escaped from the Calgary remand a few months earlier, in somewhat of a cartoon fashion. They smashed an outside window and used tied bedsheets to abseil the wall. They rappelled to the ground and ran, Simple as can be. The Calgary police couldn't find the pair until 1987, when they were picked up by the Mexican police in Mazatlan. They were charged with not only robbing a few banks and stores in Calgary and Edmonton, but also the kidnapping of 12-year-old Jeff Starkey in Calgary in a bizarre story of divorced spousal blackmail, as well as the murder of RCMP Special Constable Gordon Kowalski. It's unknown what happened to the two after their convictions, but they haven't dug out their cell using a dinner spoon yet, so a Shawshank Redemption-style ending can be written off. The rest of the 1980s and 90s went by with random quick hits to armored cars and banks, but nothing really out of the ordinary transpired in the West. Montreal was still on the top list of bank robberies in Canada, but oddly enough, Calgary was coming up second more often than not. In 1998, Calgary would finally be the top of that list, and in a very excessive fashion. Two men entered the CIBC in the North Hills shopping center wearing fake security uniforms and had the janitorial staff let them into the bank's lobby. There they loaded up their weapons and waited. At midnight, a Brinks truck pulled up to the south exit. Two guards got out and began transporting $400,000 of cash to the ATMs outside the bank. They rounded the corner in front of the Safeway and were immediately left stunned by an automatic rifle pointed straight at them. The robbers were equally as stunned, and the two parties began exchanging fire as they both ran for cover. In a two-minute period, 90 shots were fired back and forth between the guards and thieves, peppering the neighboring Safeway with lead. A tear gas grenade was thrown, and the two thieves ran out of the building with no cash and leaving heaps of evidence. Not a single round had hit its intended target. Everyone escaped without injury. It didn't take long for the police to investigate one very obvious clue. The tear gas grenade used in the escape was of military issue. This eventually led to Sergeant Darnell Bass of Ontario. The former Canadian Airborne Regiment soldier immediately confessed and pointed the finger at his accomplice, Patrick Ryan, a former Brinks employee. 
Ryan had concocted a cakewalk easy scheme where he would get his then-girlfriend breast enlargement surgery in exchange for ATM keys, timetables, and information. She obliged and the plan was on. But with any plan, it was doomed to fail. The duo were not told about the second guard for the cash, so when he showed up and started firing, all bets were off. Ryan would escape to France and would be caught thanks to Bass's testimony a few months later. Darnell Bass would go on to write a scathing autobiography called What Manner a Man. It detailed his life, brutality in the Canadian Airborne, and finally the heist. He is out of prison as of 2001 and is completely reformed now and is working as a locksmith. To round out this list, we have to fast forward a few decades later and to the most senselessly violent bank robbery in Western Canadian history. June 14, 2012. Four G4S guards were transporting $333,580 to the Hub Mall second floor ATMs. One of those guards was 21-year-old Travis Baumgartner, who had been on the job for two months. That's long enough to get your own gun. He had been in an argument with his mother that night regarding rent and him living in the house. He stormed off. This is the night he texted his friend. He often would post on Facebook about how he would love to pop people off. Travis had exactly 26 cents in his bank account, barely made rent to his mom, and owed $58,000 worth of debt to his truck. Travis and the guards entered the drop zone for the cash, locking the vault door behind them. While the three other guards bent down to deal with the bags, Travis pulled out his pistol and shot all three execution style in the back of the head. He grabbed the cash, locked the three mortally wounded guards in the room, and dashed to the G4S van. He approached the remaining guard and shot him three times, leaving him to bleed out as he made off in the armored car. He had the cash, he killed four people, so now what was the plan? I don't know, you tell me. Travis sure as hell didn't know. He stopped by two friends' houses and dropped them partying debts. He then dropped by his mother's house to change clothes and drop her $64,000, only to then steal her license plate. He drove all the way to the US-Canadian border with Washington, only to be arrested immediately with no passport. Upon questioning, he first tried to say he was David Webb from the Jason Bourne movies, and someone had threatened to kill him if he didn't get the money to them. So after that lie didn't work, he tried to convince the detectives that his co-workers had been teasing him, and this was all a crime of passion. He cried himself into a jail cell. The cops weren't buying it. They stationed an undercover officer with him, and he spilled the beans. I use hollow points, he said. Turns their brains into mush. None of them saw it coming. Very professional. This was the admission that they were looking for. He would be brought up on first-degree murder charges soon after. The sentence he received was the harshest in Canada since 1962 and the abolishment of the death penalty. 40 years without parole, and he is still serving today. Only one of his four co-workers survived, Matthew Schumann. He was put in a coma, had to relearn everything, and thankfully, was completely rehabilitated and now has a family. If you take anything away from this, just don't rob armored cars, people. Thanks for watching.